Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce to you Kelly Corrigan. Hi, Kelly. Good to see you. Good to see you. Have a seat there. Well, Kelly, thanks very much for uh, joining us today. I know you had a very busy schedule. You look great. Tell us how you're feeling. I feel great. I feel probably the best I've felt in 10 years. You know, cancer, after you finish treating cancer with all the medicine, then you're stuck with all the questions about how to live and how much you're going to exercise and whether you're going to drink alcohol and if you're going to eat organic. And, um, <laughs> and so far, I've made lots of good choices. So I actually had the... Um, the extremely pleasant situation yesterday when I was getting my Herceptin that they said, do you still weigh such and such? And I said, well, no, I don't. <laughs> I, I am 15 pounds less than that. And they said, oh, no, we have to recalculate how much Herceptin to give you. And I, so I consider that sort of a milestone. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, you were on the Today Show, and you were sharing your story in front of millions of people. How did that feel? It was great. Uh, it was interesting to talk to somebody uh, with Katie Couric because she's been through it uh, twice, unfortunately. Yeah. So she was in her 40s and lost her husband, and a year later she lost her sister. So I was having a conversation with somebody who really knew what they were talking about and really knew what the mm -hmm. experience is like. Um, and I, afterwards I was sort of reflecting that I hope I was respectful enough. You know, our story, my story and my dad also had cancer at the same time I did. Um, our story had such a happy ending, and I just, wanted to make sure that it was that I honored her for not having two hap, you know two sure. unhappy endings uh, is a lot to bear so right well take us back to the the, the day that you were diagnosed with uh, breast cancer what did the doctor tell you in terms of you know chances etc um, you know that's such a dizzying conversation um, I had had a biopsy on Friday and on and they said you know maybe seven to ten days you'll know and I really felt like, I, sorry, I really felt like I already knew because the, the doctor who looked at my mammogram films had such a grave expression mm. when he said, I want you to come back tomorrow for a biopsy. Wow. Um, but my husband was really optimistic. And so on Monday, he was going to go down to work. He works at TiVo, and it's an hour from our house. And I said, um, you know, I don't want to be melodramatic, but I sort of feel like you should be here because if the phone rings and they say I have cancer, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to take it. I'm not going to be able to wait for you for an hour to get to me. And uh, so he stayed home and he worked from home and uh, the people called at one o'clock. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just dizzying. And I, I just remember hanging up and spinning around and saying to Edward, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm defective. I didn't know. You know, I'm just going to put you through hell for this. And, and he really doesn't deserve it. You know, he's a very, uh, he's a great person to be married to. And, he, and he, he's a great father. And, you know, he didn't need the lesson. You know, you see people out there that work until midnight and barely know their kids. And he's not one of those people. And, and neither am I. So we both felt like, why is this happening to us, sure. you know? Yeah, and I saw the pictures of your two daughters. They're, they're beautiful. How, how did you try to, you know, with all the treatment, et cetera, how did you try to sort of balance all that? Well, you know, one great decision that we made early on is when I called my mom, you know, we probably talked 10 times in three days. I, my parents live in Philadelphia. And um, there's so much to do when you first get diagnosed. There's so many doctors to line up, and there's so many questions to be answered. But then that are, that are of, you know, kind of, really important timing, like are you HER2 new and are you ERPR and sure. et cetera. But then there's also the softer questions, like how are we going to find time to do this, right. to treat me? Um, and my mom said, you know, maybe you should just hire a nanny and we'll, we're happy to pay for it. And I said, um, I don't mean to be selfish, but I really would rather it be family than some person that I hired. Like I don't want to walk around bald in front of a 21-year-old girl and be afraid to burst into tears because I don't want to freak my nanny out. Oh, sure. um, <laughs> so we, we asked for help. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was a great decision because the, actually when we look back on last fall when I was in chemo, there were, there were a lot of great moments. There was a lot of tenderness and there was a lot of quality, quality time. Things slowed down a lot. We mm -hmm. said no to a lot of things. The house was dirty. 
Um, the laundry was undone. It's probably My kids than our were house. in floods because yeah. they I had to, didn't get new right. pants for them. Um, but it was really kind of a nice fall because it was all family coming together to, to solve a problem. I noticed that you uh, have a website, circusofcancer.org, okay. mm -hmm. and uh, you know the wonderful part of that about that website is you give pointers to people because I'm sure you know all of us we probably know somebody who's had cancer and you're not sure what to say or what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, even I think about, you know, do I say I'm sorry? And you give some pointers in there. Yeah, to... yeah. Well, I think, I think that the reason illness exists in the world is to keep you all employed. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, I think that it, I think it makes for really deep connections between people and, I, and deeper than anything else can, can create. Um, so I want everyone to participate in their friends and relations illnesses because I think it's, there are certain lessons you can only learn in a storm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that to the extent that people get comfortable with participating and talking and asking questions of somebody who has cancer is the extent that they can grow from it mm -hmm. and, and we can all be, you know, sort of better for it. I mean, we might as well take what we can get from it, right? I mean, if it's sure. going to be here and we can't fix it, then we might as well get the most we can out of it. So the site will help you figure out what to say in the very beginning when they first get diagnosed, um, what to say when they start chemo, what to say and do uh, when they're in radiation, how to handle the whole surgery thing. Um, so it's all there. It's circusofcancer.org. And I think they're going to have little little. I think we'll have cards some cards there uh, in case someone wants to access it. But yeah. you know, great. I think ideas in terms of just you know coming over and offering to help babysit or, or something like that. Yeah, I think you well, people, in there. you know, the ideas were just culled from my own experience, and on then also just sitting and chatting with other cancer patients. Um, we we got to like, what is the best thing that someone did for you while you were sick? Um, and one of the great best things that happened to me is that Georgia, my now four-year-old, then three-year-old, was invited to a birthday party, and I just completely forgot. And the mother who was throwing the birthday party called and said, um, I'm going to pick up Georgia. I know you forgot Henry's party. I'm going to pick up Georgia. I bought a present for her to give to Henry. Because <laughs> otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to do it, right? And um, I'll be there at 10, and I'll drop her off at 1. And it was just like, I just don't want her to have to miss anything because of me. And it just makes me so happy to think that she's going to be at Chuck E. Cheese, like, <laughs> you know, overeating and right. sugaring herself to death while, <laughs> while I'm hanging out. Obviously, I, I don't think anything prepares you for to hear what you heard and to have that, I guess, radiologist or technician not look you in the eye yeah. after looking at that mammogram. Yeah. And I'm sure you a million things must have gone through your mind. Well, you just feel like, um, you, you feel like you wish there was someone on your shoulder. You know, like, I, I am not dreaming this. Like, this is really happening, right? And I was alone in the room because, you know, it was just a mammogram. And my husband was away, and I thought, oh, he's just going to think I'm, I wish someone could see this guy's expression. And I wish someone could hear the way he said the words. Must have felt like an out-of-body experience. The whole it? well, it feels like an out-of-body experience for a long time, actually. Right. As unfortunately, you know, I mean, this is very. This is like, oh, this is what life is. Mm -hmm. You know, I I was just in Playland, you know, driving my kids to school and planning birthday parties and making macaroni and necklaces. And I know it's a, you know you you we were talking we about you were born on a sunny day. My husband used to yeah. say that about me, and nothing really bad had ever happened to you, and suddenly. Yeah the worst possible thing. And you're still having infusions of Herceptin, which is a fairly yeah. new breast cancer drug, and you'll be having those for, for a while. You're finished with chemo and radiation, right? Yep, I'm finished with um, chemo, surgery, radiation. I'm starting hormone therapy, which is fun. And um, <laughs> fun for Edward, uh, my husband. And, um, <laughs> and I am also on Herceptin, which is gonna take my chance for recurrence from about 30%. To 15%. So, thank I, God. For I was just.